I just forgot to start. Okay, so I'm explaining sampling to you. So the sampling is basically how you're going to locate your participants, resources, whatever you're going to need for data collection in your research process. Okay, now the slide explains to you um, the concept of sampling. For example, there, there are so many colorful Smarties you can see, and you need to select which type of Smartie you're going to need in your research. And based on that particular need, you're going to select a few of them, okay? Those selected few will be called sample, okay? That's the process of sampling, means choosing what is most, you know, um, appropriate towards your study or which is most related to it and which is going to get you th through your research research process exactly so each person takes a sample of smarties each group record the total number of smarties and the number of red smarties for example so we are going to locate to another picture which explains the same concept let's say we have these number of people these can be for example 50 people we call this as target population what the target population means, means those people who are related to your work. Now, are you going to select all 50 people who are related to your work? The answer certainly is no. See, you need to understand the fact that your study is going to tell you if you are going to need 50 people, five people, 10 people, or just one people. Okay, this your your teacher of research, your study, and what you're going to cover up and all that is going to tell you exactly what do you go for in, in terms of sampling or what do you want as a sample. If you're going for the explained yesterday, but I'm repeating for the sake of explanation. If you go for quantitative types of study, you need to engage a large number of people in your data, and that's how you will need maybe like more than 50 people maybe 100 people, 500 people or more, depending on, I mean, what level you are performing your research upon. But if you talk about qualitative, you just need few people since you're talking about perceptions and observation, right? There is no need for generalization of the results. That is when you're going to select and locate the number of people related to your study, okay? Yesterday, I gave the example of COVID-19. For example, if you're conducting a research on the patients that were affected out of uh, COVID-19, there might be people in large number. If you talk about the world, there'll be, there'll be people in you know large numbers. Are you going to cover all of them in your research? That again matters, right? Now, if you're going to work upon on base level, you might not go for, you know, 100 people and 500 people and more. If you're working upon MS level, master's level, you might need to go for, if you're going for quantitative, you may lead between 100 to 500 people, okay? That is how levels matter and that is how your nature of research also matters. So I was explaining target population to you, which will be denoted by a capital N in the thesis. Now, we select sample from target population, right? For example, the target population is people who were affected by COVID-19, right? Now, you are going to select few people which you can address, okay? Now, you need to go for like 50 people. If you think you can work on 50 people, you can go on 10 people if you think that is applicable to you and that is you know, quite okay for you. That depends from study to study, context to context, level, and everything else. So keeping all these parameters in you view, you're going to select your sample, all right? Now, for example, I am a person who is not going for quantitative, but qualitative type of data. Again, I will have certain number of people associated with me, and they'll be working with me in my research process. Right now, I will select that selected, you know, group of, uh, you know, people from target population, and I will de denote that or represent that with small n, okay, not capital. The capital N in the thesis represents total target population, and the small, uh, you know, n represents the selected ones, and those selected ones are exactly called as sample.
right? Now you call it sample, just sample or sample size. It depends on whatever you want to say. Then we have effective sampling produces an N, which is representative of the capital N. Now, target population are everybody who is related to your work, but this the sample is the one, the, the group of people, you feel comfortable working with them and you can be accessible to them. And you think, okay, they are going to answer you. They are going to provide you data. And you have, for example, contact numbers. You know, it, this is how you're going to mention and this is how you're going to look at it. Because it is my, that there can be a case, for example, when you might, you know, go for a 50 people, but it's not necessary that all 50 people will be addressing to you at the same time. So what will happen? Then you need to again go for target population, again, go and research upon that, what, what type of people I'm going to work upon and how can I, you know, access them. So that is how we're going to select sample with, you know, to avoid, you know, any uh, sort of inconvenience. The N is only ever representative of capital N and it was drawn from not necessarily the general population. So it depends basically that you're going to like, you know, work on which type of people and how many type of people so exactly. We have different strategies of sampling. I mean, choosing people from target population. See, this is your target population and this is your selected group. So it depends. You might go for females, for example, if your study suggests. You might go for males. You might go for children. You might go for educationists. You might go for politicians. You know, it depends on whatever type of study you're going to cover up. Same happens in the... Same happens with the experimental group as well, experimental type of research or quantitative type of research as well. So that depends from one field to another field, but the strategies remain same. Population might be different, right? Let's move ahead. So how are you going to achieve this sample size? That statistics is going to help you. And basically we have one type of sampling, which is convenient sampling. And in that type, we are going to select people who we are, you know, accessible, uh, you know, to, or comfortable working with them. And we think they are most related to our work, or maybe there could be other reasons as well. I mean, this as a researcher is your job to go and contact them. So you can contact target population, for example, people of, uh, you know, number of 50 or 100, and then you may end up having 60 people in your group and the rest of the group, uh, rest of the people did not participate or did not, you know, um, it can be anything, it can matter. So that is how we locate a larger number of people. And then we select those people from that particular target group who are comfortable working with us or we are comfortable working with them. So in experimental group or in quantitative type of research, we are going to see what, where is a dependent variable working in. It can be working in this sample size, but it may have slight variations throughout the research. That is why it is called experimental type of research because it keeps on changing its phases and phases throughout the, throughout the research. Okay, I'll explain sampling again uh, in the end, okay? Let's see some types of doing that. So first of all is random. That random selection means you may select people based on certain features. For example, you're locating for female students. So you'll be selecting, you know, from 100 students, you'll be selecting only female students. So with this method, you may have, you may end up having, you know, 30 people, 40 people, 50 people out of 100 or whatsoever. This is some random sampling method. You may, you know, have one particular feature with you, which you want to work upon, and then you may go for selection. The second thing is randomly selected a group and then take the sample. The state sampling means, uh, you know, therein and then, then you are going to be the person who is having the authority to any time at any point 
change something. Okay. Now changing means uh, I may substitute someone with another person at the end of the moment as well. Whereas in other research, uh, you know, random or sampling types, we do not, you know, do that. And we cannot do that. We cannot change anything. Um, but in stage sampling method, you may go for it with a particular excuse. It's not like I want to do this. Uh, I should be having one particular excuse, okay? The third method is cluster. When you are working with a particular group, I told you yesterday, for example, you're going to work on private schools or public schools. These private and public schools are a lot of different entities coming up in this one big you know, name. I mean, name of the group, and then you will have multiple, you know, areas, multiple groups working under that particular area. So that is how you're going to look at. If you want to go for cluster, you need to see which type of group you're working upon. Um, I would add here, if you are working on, you know, certain thesis topic, which relates to certain groups of people, you must have to go for a cluster right there you may not have you know uh, the choice to select for random or stage or any other something method then i have stratified which includes the same method that i've explained you earlier for example male female you're going for these characteristics but with equal population for example i'm working with 50 percent of male students and 50 percent of female students this is how stratified something works so I need to select 50 students, 50 students as girls and 50 students as boys. This is how I need to make myself here. And if I need to change the ratio, I can do that. I mean, depending on what type of people you are, you know, comfortable with. So Stratified has like, you know, equal, equal uh, data. Then we have systematic means one, two, three, fourth person, every second person, every fifth person, or maybe every 10th person whatever you like maybe you have 100 people and you're working on every second pe person from those 100 people that that is how you're going to select these are certain strategies of sampling i mean choosing participants for your study and i would like to mention here that it matters with the difference in fields as well for example you talk about stratification it is least applicable in art students or literature or language related we normally go for random sampling or convenient sampling that we call it, or maybe systematic sometimes. But you talk about science students, they go for stratification uh, most of the times. And they go for cluster as well. Since we are talking about quantitative, it has to deal with generalizations and that goes for. Then we have opportunity. If for example, you lost your participants, you can, you should not go uh, through all the data collection procedure. You can have a convenient group for you, which can be which can be substituent, and which can act as a substituent if you lost participants. By lost participants means if they are no more in connection or no more in contact with you. So it depends, and it is very much applicable. It happens many times that you lose participants and. I mean, at that point, you can go for convenient. That means you can, you know, take people as many people as you want, and you can go for, you know, the rest of the process that you have. Yesterday, I talked about reasoning, deductive and inductive reasoning, which is more related to logic. I explained yesterday to you. This scientific method has a specific, uh, you know, place in your research process. For example, you are a person who is working on a something related to science and something related to a little bit invention. And if you do not, do not uh, you know, explain things well, or the logic element is missing in your thesis or your research, you might fail that particular process, that, that particular thesis or that particular whatsoever it is. So reasoning or logic is that much important. It is important in all the types of, you know, or all the fields. But if you talk about science, it is a compulsory or it's must. Okay, so since it applies, you know, theories or laws, so that is why it has to be proved at the end of your thesis. If it is not proved, then you might go for like, you know, conducting the whole process again. 
So this is how it is important. And, you know, it, it applies to literature students as well. But we, since we do not have to prove something at the end of the research, we just are going to give our own opinion about that particular you know, analysis. So that is how we have a room for improvement. But when you talk about science students, you need to be very much peculiar about your reasoning. We can do that in two methods. We have deductive and inductive reasoning. From deductive, we go from general to specific, right? Just the way I explained that, for example, you're going for private schools and you're going to locate students in private schools and you're going to work upon them. You need to be very much clear about and specific about what type of private schools you, you want to count in. Okay, if you talk about private schools in Pakistan, you may have a very big list of schools, but you may not be able to, you know, working with all of them. So you need to cut them short and then, you know, decide for that. So you, you're going from general to specific. When you talk about inductive, you go from specific to general, which is more like in quantitative type of data collection, where you're going from specific to generalization. The main purpose of quantitative study is to generalize the, the results to a larger number of population, right? Conf confirmation of a theory from your own observations and Formation of a theory grounded in your own observation. I am going to explain this to you in, in terms of different fields. For example, you talk about uh, you know, science fields. We have theories that we are going to prove at the end of our research, right? When you talk about arts or literature, we do not have to prove anything. That says the grounded theory is when you don't have to prove anything. And the general theory is, or the general rule of thumb is when you have to prove things at the end of the research. So I can say that deductive reasoning works from general to specific in a manner that you can go with a particular flow and process. You may not be worried about like, you know, um, you, you need to be worried about uh, you know, proving that theory. But when you talk about inductive, you may not be able to prove that. Okay, and if, if, if you're not able to prove that, it is completely okay. That is how these vary. With this, I come to, I've been repeating quantitative and qualitative quite often. So let's see what this is. So quantitative aims to assess a pre-stated theory. Okay, something which is already given. I am explaining something which is already given. Okay, and I may be like, you know, proving or not proving that. But when you talk about qualitative, it creates a novel theory. That means it is going to give us an elaborated, like, you know, form of uh, method that you have applied and you've got the results with. So there, I already told you, since we're working with people and perception, so qualitative is quite flexible. When you talk about quantitative, you're not working with you know, in, in terms of people, we are working with numbers. Of course, there are people, but they are in numbers, okay? And you're talking about facts and figures and statistics always. So we have little room for improvement in quantitative, whereas in quali qualitative, we have a lot of things to improve upon. Then in quantitative, you have hypothesis, which is the biggest, uh, you know, prime factor of difference between these two. We have hypothesis that we are going to prove or not at the end of the thesis. And we are as in qualitative, we do not have any sort of hypothesis, okay? Then we have uh, attempts to minimize the influence of the researcher on the outcome, right? We do not have place as a researcher in quantitative study. I mean, science students, you are here. We do not have a place as a researcher um, and quantitative, but if you talk about qualitative, we have a very big place. And, you know, as a researcher, your observation matters, your perceptions matter, but at conclusion section and suggestions uh, in your thesis, not everywhere, obviously. Then in qualitative, researcher becomes an inherent part of the study. There's an ethnographic study I, I will explain later on but I'll just give you an introduction about that. Ethnographic studies are those studies where you as a researcher have to go to a certain place, live with those people, and then give your documentaries upon or, you know, 
मे बी यू आर राइटिंग ऑटोबायोग्राफी जिस तरह आप ऑटोबायोग्राफी किसी की लिखते हैं या यू नो यू आर क्रिएटिंग डॉक्यूमेंट्रीज अबाउट अ पर्टिकुलर प्लेस अबाउट पर्टिकुलर कल्चर अबाउट पर्टिकुलर पीपल दैट टाइप ऑफ स्टडी इज कॉल इथनोग्राफिक स्टडी एंड दैट हैज टू बी टेकन प्लेस वेन यू एज अ रिसर्चर आर गोइंग टू बी इनहेरेंट पार्ट ऑफ दैट okay you cannot detach yourself and you're sitting somewhere else in the world and then you're working upon just the way we work it does not happen that way okay then we have quantitative data infers statistics it uses test statistics and it must have but if you talk about qualitative it is not always necessary to use statistics although we use statistics at a level of creating percentages maybe ratios maybe or maybe having pie charts and etc not more than that but you talk about quantitative it has complete you know set of statistics working with it i mean quantitative is nothing without statistics you can conclude it that way then we have data collection therefore requires closed responses okay you must have had you know question is at this point in life you must have had questionnaires from different researchers if you have filled those questionnaires you might realize that you may or may not have open ended responses you may have closed ended responses in questionnaire for example tick yes or no okay or select any one from above this is closed ended when you talk about open ended explain why do you think like this okay if there's this sort of question where you are going to explain yourself and that is called open ended a uh, sort of data process the data collection process now open ended happens only in qualitative when you talk about quantitative you need to be very much closed and fixed in your responses you may not have a big place or celebrated place in quantitative whereas in qualitative you matter a lot since qualitative works on people and their interpretations and their understanding so it works that way right now we have based on epistemology and positivism and interpretive interpretivism now see sometimes you need to you know state things just as the way they are depending on your nature of study and sometimes you are going to be part of that particular process when you're going to explain things just the way they are it is positivism that relates to quantitative right again and when you are going to explain something but being a part of it as a researcher you are going to be interpretivism interpreter now that interpreter has a place in qualitative only right so these are different strategies now we talk about ontology in this you have objectivism explaining something which is independent of external outcomes again quantitative you're talking about something which is objective you have no opinion you know subjectivism subjectivism in quantitative right whereas if you talk about constructionism you are going to explain how certain things work okay similarly we have interpretive interpretivism that explains you know qualitative again when you talk about qualitative you may have a place to explain things okay you how do you feel how do you think about certain strategies and how do you react to certain things you have a place to explain in your words when you talk about uh, you know quantitative you do not have that you need to just give close ended responses so you need so that we can be objective not subjective see we are talking about a big number of people we are having a lot of number of people so we need to be very much particular about you know responses if i am a person who is researching upon you know um, you know both the methods i'm going to go for quantitative first and then i'm going to go for qualitative the the quantitative type of study i am not interested in knowing individual responses from participants but in qualitative i'm very much responsible responsible to capture everybody's perceptions with me right this is how these things are different from each other
So studies in natural sciences often requires a positivistic and objectivistic approach. Okay? But studies in social sciences often require interpretive. I told you again, you need to be very much, you know, interpretive in a manner that you can incorporate people and their perceptions with you. And then you can have a constructivist approach towards them. Now, what does constructivist approach mean? These things means that you are going to be developing, you know, your, um, uh, you know, your strategies based on perceptions of your participants, right? If your participants suggest something to you, okay, I have one minute left. I need to stop it here and then I will restart the class again, okay? <laughs> 